Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Tilted Lawyer podcast. This morning, we have a tremendous show for you. We're going to be talking about the Micah Miller case, a story that is capturing the minds and hearts of the world, really. It's uh, it's a heartbreaking case in, involving severe bouts of domestic violence. Um, it involves potentially artificially uh, manipulated evidence by way of 911 call. We're going to explore what's going on in this case, what's going on now, why is the FBI currently investigating, even though the death has already been ruled uh, not a murder, um, and answer some of your questions. You're going to want to get started. Stick around. It's going to be a good one. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrano with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I want to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. All right, folks. Micah Miller is a 30-year-old woman who on April 27th took her own life. And there's been a lot of speculation as to the circumstances of why she would do such a thing. But it happened. There was a 911 phone call placed after she had driven about an hour uh, from a sporting goods store where she purchased a weapon that ultimately uh, was ruled the culprit in ending her life. There's been some speculation that that voice was AI generated. If you ask my personal opinion, I'll tell you right now, I don't think that it was. There has been an ever-evolving cavalcade of allegations of domestic violence and grooming and all kinds of nastiness on the part of her husband, the pastor, JP. And we're going to talk all about that. Uh, But this is a case uh, that, coincidentally enough, I had wanted to do since I learned about it on a Wednesday. I got a, um, a comment on Thursday morning asking me from Lulu, I think it was, asking that uh, we cover the cases. Hey, well, coincidentally, we were already planning the live stream. I'm joined by Ileana Clone Rosa, who is back from her illness. Yes. <laughs> what is her illness, you might say? Well, she used to have a parasite and gave birth to it. And now her parasite <laughs> continues to uh, house various viruses and germs, and it's constantly infecting her and her husband. Yes, that she brings from daycare. <laughs> such is the, the nature of uh, children. Um, I'm also joined by producer Dominic, who is, uh, after having, spending about an hour having panic attacks over there, <laughs> has calmed himself down where we're ready to do this show. Uh, so just a brief summary of where we're at with this case. Um, a lot of what I, all right, just a word of caution. In terms of what is out there, there's a lot of misinformation floating around which is the nature of cases that are three weeks old we've been covering for like last month cases that have been years and years old seven years old five years old three this one just happened and there's a lot of speculation the way that it happened has been particularly sinister for example her husband um, whom she married is the pastor of a church out there in south carolina um on the sunday service after his wife had passed away He gave a full-blown, one-hour-long sermon, as he normally would, uh, joking around, telling jokes, you know, having a good time, singing songs up there in front of his flock of however many uh, people were in attendance. And then at the end, at the conclusion of the sermon, decided to just casually say, oh, and by the way, my wife has passed away. As you guys have well known, she's had a lot of health problems. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but just to let you know, it was just kind of like a, uh, the daily church bulletin. <laughs> um, he just very disrespectfully uh, let everybody know in, in, in on uh, what was going on. And so what do you make of his, his her husband, Eliana? What would you say? The definition of... Let me uh, frame that. <laughs> Your, Your Honor, I would draw the question. Let me rephrase. <laughs> you are a family law attorney. Mm-hmm. A great deal percentage of your cases has to do with domestic violence. And by the way, it's going to yes. be a very major theme on today's show. Um, 
from what you know and your expertise, what do you make of the way that her husband has behaved himself? He's the definition of a controlling and abusive partner. Um, from his behavior, like manipulative, um, narcissistic, narcissistic, the buzzword that everybody likes, um, alienating. It's just everything <laughs> that you find in that definition of domestic violence. He pretty much matches everything except, well, I don't know about if there was a, any physical violence. I think there was like a, uh, an allegation that she had a black eye at once. Well, I can tell you this. Uh, there's unequivocally been mm -hmm. evidence of him slashing tires, yes, placing GPS definitely. trackers mm -hmm. on her car, showing up at car dealerships that he learned of her location from the GPS trackers, um, causing a scene. I got some video of that. Disseminating. That we're going to uh, naked pictures of her oh on facebook and then apologizing hey so it was really evil that i did that but the picture's yes. only up for an hour and it's because he pissed me off and we're going to talk about that so in yeah. case you are uninformed this is what happened to micah miller i'm reading from an article from time.com uh, on april 27th she was seen in footage leaving her home in myrtle beach south carolina at around 11:58 a.m Eastern Standard Time, Micah then goes to Dick's Pawn Shop at 12.12 12 p.m. where she purchased a gun. She makes a 911 call around 2.54 after driving about an hour from that, that shop, asked if a dispatcher was able to uh, track her location. Dispatcher asks to tell her what happened. Micah responded, I'm about to, to blank myself, mm -hmm. off myself, and I just want my family to know where to find me, and then she hangs up. There's been a witness that's been located in the case that was fishing nearby, um, says that he heard crying for a couple of minutes and then heard a gunshot, and then that was it. The body was found uh, approximately 40 meters from the shell casing, and her body was in the water when it was finally located by law enforcement. Um, that's not from the article. That's just my uh, me reciting from memory. Um, investigators located a Sig Sauer gun in the passenger seat of the vehicle and a box of ammunition in the center console of the vehicle. Investigators also found a receipt for the handgun from the shop where it was located. And the uh, sheriff's department has released a 31-page, basically a PowerPoint presentation of all the investigation um, evidence that they collected. We'll go through some of that in the course of our show. Um, while they were searching for Micah, police were approached by an individual who said they found a bag near the edge of the water, said he heard crying. That's the witness that we just mm -hmm. talked about, and a gunshot while he was fishing. A uh, bag had Micah's ID in it. Law enforcement received a call from someone who said they had found the body in the water. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Now, there's been a lot of online conspiracies. Um, but just to clear up some of them, she was not shot in the back of the head. That is not what happened. That was a rumor that was floating around. Um, there has been some theories about perhaps her voice was AI generated, and that really comes from Micah's family. Um, they, and we're going to listen to the recording of the 911 call, but in that call, they just say that she doesn't sound right. Her, mm -hmm. her speech is slowed. Um, it just doesn't sound much like her. And they were speculating for that perhaps mm -hmm. it was AI. I've listened to it. Um, I don't think it was an AI generated voice. And there's enough evidence to, to, to suggest that what actually happened is definitely, probably, she uh, unalived herself uh, by way of gunshot. There's surveillance of her getting up in the morning at 10 a.m. around her apartment. There's surveillance of her going into the gun shop. There is there, there's video of her driving to the location by herself in the same car that she got there from. Um, there's a 911 phone call. There's a witness involved. I have no reason, based on what is known and what's been released from law enforcement, uh, to think that anybody else is involved. Her husband herself, uh, himself, was in another city um, far away from her, apparently with a mistress that he yes. has. Um, and so I don't, I'm not so sure. Well, we don't, the investigation is not concluded. They have concluded that she did uh, take her own life. But the FBI is curiously still investigating the case. For what purpose? I don't know. Um, there has been 
a number of allegations of financial misgivings on the part of herself and her husband. Uh, whether she was involved in that, I don't know. Her family said that she's been cleared of all charges. I just know that there's currently an ongoing FBI investigation. Um, so the bigger question in this case and why people are looking so closely at her husband is because there's been a long um, list of allegations related to domestic violence in the way that her husband, for all the reasons that you just stated, Eliana, has treated her, whether or not his actions have led to her demise, causing her to do what she did, um, whether or not he was responsible for something more sinister. There's been theories of, oh, what if he just hired somebody to, to, to take her life? I just don't think that's what happened, not on the evidence that we have that doesn't appear to be faked. Um, but this show is going to be devoted a lot towards women who are in this position. And I don't care so much about gender equality as I have this discussion with you. I'm, I'm talking mostly about the reality of situations when women find themselves in abusive relationships. There's this one clip that's very famous that I ran across on TikTok mm -hmm. of this radio personality um, I don't know anything about the guy and, and, and his appearances, but he sounds like a slovenly, probably overweight, round, woman-hating individual. There's this lady that calls up that was complaining about um, her ex-husband who abused her for two years mm -hmm. and then was not paying child support. And he's, like, yelling at her. It's yeah. like... Well, maybe it's your fault for opening up your legs to somebody that was like that. I mean, you're the one that did it, you know, and then you live with him and he's abusive mm -hmm. for two years. And, you know, now you want to cry about it and say, oh, I'm the victim and all of this. You're the one that chose to stay with him. You're the one that chose to be with him in the first place. Um, and he's just, you know, and the woman just exasperated. Like, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to say? You know, and there's some men that take that position. Mm -hmm. Why don't you ever talk about the men that don't pay child support? Because it's women like you who spread your legs with guys like that. No, I, why, why don't you ever talk about the responsibility of women no, who no, choose no, no, irresponsible no, no. males to, to no, procreate no, 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 with and then no, complain no, no, later when they're no, irresponsible? No, no, no. The women who have a one-nighter with a bartender or a guy on a motorcycle or a musician, and then you complain later on the guy's a deadbeat. He was a deadbeat to begin with. Why nobody can ever talk to you because you don't let any People talk to me all day long. You can can't no, talk to me. No, I'm trying to talk to you, and you're talking over. I, dear, don't tell me how to do a radio show. I've been doing this for 25 years. I don't need your help. Oh, okay, let me. Let me. Can I please just say this? I was married once before. Okay. Mm -hmm. My husband and I had a child together. Right. After I was tired of him beating me for two years, I left him. Really? But why did you tolerate it for two years? Can I? Can you tell me why you tolerated being beaten for two years? I'd like to hear about this. My answer to that is because I was young and stupid. Okay, I agree with you. There you go. You were stupid. No doubt about it. And now what are you going to complain that he doesn't pay child support? A guy who beat you for two years? Imagine that. The guy is irresponsible. Right. He beat me for two years, and now that deadbeat doesn't pay. Why is it my There's fault your big concern. Me? Now we see why you're so upset about this. You chose a manifestly irresponsible, violent individual to procreate with. Then you're amazed that the guy doesn't send you child support. He didn't Who's, me until you, you, you're, you're still, you know what, dear? You were young and stupid. Now you're old and stupid. And there's a lot of men that would cheer him on, a, a great, per, a good percentage of men that would cheer him on. Mm -hmm. But the reality of these cases is people that engage in domestic violence never start off as the beast. Mm -hmm. They always start off as the prince. Oh, yes. Men Good show morning. you what they want to see, what they want you to see in order to sleep with you. Mm -hmm. And once they've accomplished that, then it becomes a different game. You know, uh, make sure that we get her and secure whatever. They do all those things. And then once you cross the event horizon of marriage, mm -hmm. and it's not just for women, it's for men and women. Sometimes women do the same thing. Yes. They present themselves a certain way. They're trying to lock in the man. They got the man, and all of a sudden, boom, you get version B mm -hmm. or version 2.0, which is a downgraded version from the version that she wanted you to believe that she was when you married her. Men are the same way. You got this guy, and he was clean cut, and he, his hygiene was good, and he was taking to nice places, and he was romancing you and giving you flowers and telling you nice things. Maybe he was writing you poems. Maybe he was mm -hmm. taking you on extravagant dates, and you guys didn't have any children. You were guys in the, in the, were in the courting phase, and then all of a sudden, you cross over the ho event horizon of marriage, and now um, he owns you, and you, he, he, he bought the farm, he bought the cow, and he de has certain demands, and you will not 
talk to your friends. You will not talk to your family. You will not have other male friends. You will not dress a certain way. I demand to have dinner cooked at 6.30 p.m. because that's the role of a wife. And the Bible says that a woman is to be subservient to men, and you will be subservient to me because I am this pastor in a church, um, and I am this person of stature, and people follow me and listen to my voice. And I could, hey, watch, just with the flip of my voice, I could manipulate an entire congregation into taking my side, and they will know that I am a God-fearing man and that you are a subservient woman who is being disobedient. And should you continue to be on this path, not only will you be excommunicated from this church, but you will be excommunicated from this home, and I will take a mistress or two, and you're going to sit there and like it because God says I should have these things. And when a woman is dealing with all of that and she's gone through all of those things, you have no right to say that, hey, you knew who you were marrying when you decided to marry him. No, mm-hmm. no, people change. Yes. And quickly, human psychology is a complicated thing, and it happens 100% of the time that the person that you married, even us, mm-hmm. even even who we married, they are not the same people as they were on the day that they said, I do. I am not the same person as I was on the day that I married my wife. Mm -hmm. We change and we evolve and it's an art. And one of the, 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 the great challenges of marriage that we evolve with our partners or we are Mm -hmm. doomed uh, to inevitable divorce, which is why um, divorce attorneys exist in various things. (laughs) But, I don't have, and I don't, it hasn't happened in the comments. I'm not looking at the comments right now, but I will not tolerate because I've heard it. Um, and it's so often the case in, in some of these cases where people start victim blaming. Yes. I'm not very much for buzzwords. I'm not very much for, you know, woke politics or all of that, but I will not tolerate anybody that wants to defend her husband and say that, oh, well, she had a role in it, you know, by the way that she acted, behaved. Mm -hmm. There's no person that deserves to be the victim of domestic violence. Whatever your differences, um, there's no reason why a man should ever take up a position of physical superiority for the purposes of intimidation. And I apologize for that rant, but a lot of the reason why this case hooked my interest was specifically because of the domestic violence aspect mm-hmm. of it. I have a lot of clients that are going through this. I've seen people that are very close to me go through things like this. And it's a very real thing that women have to go. I'm raising women. All of my children are, are girls. I just had my daughter turn 18. She's a woman now. <laughs> and one of the great horrors, horrific realizations that I had um, upon her 18th birthday is she go, she's going to grad night. Her birth date was on her grad night. Oh. And she bought herself a, a tiara Um, She said, oh, I bought it with my money. No, she bought it with my credit card that has her name on it (laughs) that I gave her with uh, for emergencies. But she bought a a tiara and like this slash that said um, 18th birthday or something Mm -hmm. like that. And which I thought was an innocent thing. But then I started thinking that I know how men think. And um, you don't need to be advertising that you're 18 like that. That's a, you know, there's this trend that's going on on uh, TikTok. Um, Would you rather be? Uh, alone in the woods with a man or a bear. And a lot of women are using that as an opportunity. It's like, well, the bear wouldn't have never um, took intimate photos of me mm-hmm. and spread them to my family. Well, the bear would have never uh, told me to shut up and because I don't want to get arrested and all these yeah. traumas that they've gone through. Um, and I got to say, if my daughter was alone in the woods with a bear or some random guy... I'd probably rather she be alone with the bear because the bear just might leave her alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and you never know what threat of violence a man would possess. I don't trust men because I am a man, uh, because I've been doing this job for far too long, uh, because I've seen the struggles that my mom and, you know, various other people have gone through. It's, um, it, it's a scary, big, scary world out there for women. What do you think about all that, Eliana? I agree. I mean, as a woman and also as a family law attorney, what I see every day, it's just super scary what women have to go through. And it's it's just hard. And it's hard for a lot of people to understand until they are in the position to go through that. Like, it's easy for me to say, oh, yeah, I wouldn't stay in that uh, relationship where I would have left 
but it's not until you're there that you really understand why you stayed and why you didn't do the things that people think you should have done to get out of that relationship. Absolutely. And um, that's, you know, at the heart of this case, it's a, it's a, it's a topic that Mm -hmm. lots of people are dealing with. And I think we need to spread light to it. And I think it's important that men, women have to understand the way that men think and guys like um, JP Miller, um, I know guys like that. Oh, yes, me too. I got to tell you that I've been litigating these cases now for going on 10 years now, over 10 years, these domestic violence cases. I don't know if you have ever been accused of this, mm-hmm. Eliana, but I'm, I'm willing to guess that you haven't. Mm-hmm. But on three occasions mm-hmm. in these domestic violence cases, specifically mm-hmm. in cases where my clients have made allegations of, of domestic violence against mm-hmm. their partners, um, I have been accused of trying to intimidate um, and uh, scare off uh, the offending party. Oh, okay. Because it, it goes like this. <laughs> I don't know, because I know how men talk to mm-hmm. my assistant, Melissa. Yes. And Melissa tells me about how they're so disrespectful mm-hmm. and they're doing all of this and that and they won't listen to her and they're being super rude and calling her names. But then I jump on the phone with them and all of a sudden they're perfect gentlemen. Yes. You know, because I'm a man, I have the right to talk to them as that way. Um, women oftentimes are the weaker sex, mm-hmm. the weaker of the partners. And one of the things that insecure men do, and I find that domestic violence occ- occurs 99% of the time in, in, in um, insecure men. Mm-hmm. The easiest way for them to win an argument is to impose themselves physically on a woman. And they'll do that for various other reasons. Um, but the second that I approach them and they start trying to make the same demands of me, and I was like, no, we're not going to do all of that. Um, and then it's like, well, then I'm not going to do this. And all right, well, I guess we're just going to go in front of the judge. And then the guy will literally say, um, I feel like this attorney is trying to intimidate me. <laughs> That's happened three times in my career, every single time in these DV cases. And I have a theory, I have a theory mm-hmm. that men just get really uncomfortable mm-hmm. if their main method of communication is intimidation and they don't have that ability with the other person. Then it's like, a, all right, well, let me just get the hell out of here response. But they can't because we're going to court. Well, I guess my situation it's a little bit different because I'm a female. Yeah. What I have experienced is the total opposite. These men try to be super nice and charming with me mm. as they were with their partners, I guess, in the beginning. Yes. And try to show me that they're this really good person and that my client is the one that is lying and see how good I am and how cooperating I am with you to try to convince me that, I guess. He's, for, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Obviously, and, your client's a liar. your client is a liar. That's what I have encountered. But in a domestic violence case that I had where it was my client was the male and he was the one being accused. And the woman, what she ended up doing is that when she couldn't get me, I guess, on her side, <laughs> she then started accusing me of having a relationship with my client. <laughs> of course. Well, <laughs> funny you should mention, I've been ac- accused multiple times of that by the males in the other cases. Yes. It's like, obviously, obviously. Um, she's, <laughs> something's going on with her yeah. and the attorney. And, oh, it's... um. Because what other reason to believe this guy other than you have something with him? Like, that's... Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, let's go through this timeline. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to go through the police timeline. So here's what we know. This is this is what happened to Micah. April 25th, John Paul Miller is served with divorce papers. Now, she had filed for divorce back in October. Separation, legal separation. Was it a legal separation? Yes. Oh, this so that I, might be the first time you've ever corrected me. Well, from I don't what think it's I the read, first. I think she filed for legal separation maybe twice. Definitely in October. Definitely October and got dismissed in February. And then yeah. she filed again in April, but for divorce. They drew up a post nuptial agreement. Oh, I didn't know that. I believe in 2020. I have the document. We just mm-hmm. look at the date. But there was a post nup where she's supposed to get a couple of things. It wasn't very mm-hmm. long. But yeah. Um, on April 25th, he served divorce papers just mm-hmm. two days before Micah's body is found. On mm-hmm. April 27th is, of course, when she was found in Robeson County. Um, April 28th, 
John Paul, the day after John Paul Miller announces Micah's death, at the end of his sermon, and this is verbatim what he said, um, I'm taking, a, after he's already given one hour's sermon. Um, I'm going to have you stand up, and I'm going to make an announcement, and um, after the announcement, I'm going to ask that you, um, you leave church quietly and, and don't talk about the announcement here in the building, please, if you can, so y'all can stand to your feet. Um, hey, is that coming through on the live stream, Dominic? Do, do, when I play the the thing, does it? Well, let me check. I'm looking at your thing right now. Before I make the announcement, I also yeah, want good. to say that um, it's coming through. My request to you is that you will continue to come to church and serve and give um, for the next you know little bit. Because I don't want to have. I'm taking a little bit of a break, and I don't want to have to worry about the church. My break may be a few days, a few weeks. I don't know. Um, I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And yeah, it was it was self induced. And it was uh, up in North Carolina. And um, we're going to have a funeral for her next Sunday here at 3 p.m. And so um, it's, it's all I can, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of going on um, adrenaline right now. So y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. And uh, she was, she wasn't, y'all knew that she wasn't well mentally. And that uh, she needed her, her medicine that was hard to get to her. And so um, I'm sure there'll be more details to come. But um, just keep our family in your prayers. And I'm going to let Pastor Randall, my bishop, uh, he can pray. I get a microphone. He'll pray out, and if you have anything you want to share as well, uh, I appreciate it. All right, my, my initial thoughts is for what reason I needed to say. You guys knew she was mentally ill and she needed medicine and couldn't get it to her. You know who says things like that? People that are. It's like that one episode. Do you ever watch the the, the Office, the show? No. Dominic, you ever watch that show? I you know, know what show it is. I just don't. Yeah, watch you it. know that one episode where they're going to steal the printer from that other branch, yeah. and then they're dressed up as like security guards, and then Dwight Schrute is like. Um, Hey, I'm I'm the security guard. Don't you do you see my name tag? You see my new uniform? Yep. Do you need it? We are in a stairwell. We are climbing some stairs. I'm breathing heavily. Okay, you know what? You really don't need to be updating me as much as you're updating me. Whoa, there's a guy. There's a guy. It's a security guard. Do you need any more proof? You know, like he's trying mm -hmm. to perpetuate this lie. He sounds like a guy that's trying to do that. Um, well, it's the classic tale where the abuser claims that the other person is crazy whenever they, I mean, like I see it all the time in domestic violence uh, cases. Oh, yeah she's insane or she's crazy she's not taking her meds whenever yeah. the other person accuses on well, the gaslighting yeah, of the course. gaslighting pretty much and that whole all oh, the medicines were hard to get um they're not that hard are, yeah. are available like over <laughs> the easy. counter sometimes yeah. <laughs> and yeah i don't even know what meds he was he was talking about yeah. but there there was there uh, another video uh, a few months ago that his dad had brought up about how she had threatened to to take her life again um, where she had sta stated that she tried to do it, but the gun jammed or something like that. Um, I haven't seen that video personally, but it's out there. There's this podcaster that I just found the other day. Um, she's a Swedish podcaster. Uh, I think it's True Crime or True Grizzly, True Grizzly something. I want to get it right because she is one of the most gri grizzly true crime. She's really, really good. If you're looking for information, she's already done a full-on deep dive of, of all the... She's made calls to law enforcement and all this stuff. Yes. Um, she put together a, a string of all those sur the surveillance about an hour mm -hmm. long, about the, from the time that she went from her apartment to the gun shop to her driving on the freeway and all those things. Um, she's really good. But in terms of non-attorney, mm -hmm. um, non-professional podcaster, she's really good at just presenting facts. Um, and she's from Sweden, which I wanted to give her a shout-out because we for whatever reason, have a, a, a good deal of Swedish fans. Where's all our Swedish fans at? They're in there somewhere. Um, she's pretty big. I just heard of her yesterday in, in my search for information about this case, but uh, go check her out um, if you have the time. But getting back into this timeline, I actually want to go through, uh, before I get through the rest of this, the police timeline. So they released this PDF about 31 pages long. Um, let me see if I could pull it up. 
Um, so let's go through this timeline since I have it up. All right. So this is a very meticulous timeline. So at 2.54, you hear that 911 call. And let's hear the 911 call. I want to play mm -hmm. that before yes. we go any further. Um, this is it. I'm going to play the entire two-minute thing. And just there's a, a major trigger warning. Uh, this is going to be dealing with um, stories of self-harm. And this isn't a story. This is a real-life phone call that Micah played shortly before her death. Um, but this is the actual 911 call that was placed. It's, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking to listen to, so be forewarned. But here we go. Robinson County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Hi. Um, are you able to trace the location of my phone? You don't know where you're at? A national park. What's the phone number you're calling me from? Um, where's the park located at? In Fair Bluff. I have my location on, I think, on my phone. Find my phone is on. I just did my share my location. Okay, I'm showing, um... Hold on one second. Don't think you are in Robinson County. We at Lumber the Lumber River State Park. In yeah, that's where I am. Okay. Tell me what's um happened. Um, I'm about to kill myself, and I just want my family to know where to find me. Okay, ma'am. Just listen to what I'm saying, okay? Let me make sure I got the exact location where you're at, okay? Just one minute. Is that it? I think that's, yeah, that's the entire thing. Okay. Um, Ileana, does that sound like an AI-generated phone call to you? I don't think so. No, well, I have an example. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how easy it would be to create an AI-generated version of my voice. Okay. I feel like you would, well, let me just give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, I have created an AI version of my voice. I'm going to play it for the audience, and I want you guys to be the judge. Okay. It's going to be my tagline for Mic Checks. Here's me. This is obviously me. The following has been a message brought to you by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. Now, here's AI-generated Omar saying the same thing. The following has been a message brought to you by the Gibber of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That doesn't sound anything like me, not even a little bit. It's like all nasally it and... Computer a little generated. high computer generated. <laughs> now it's probably not the best of AI software, yes. but it's difficult to produce an actual likeness of somebody's voice. As far as I have tried, mm -hmm. now I'm not an expert on AI by any means, but my experience with AI is it's really good at doing some things, but not in everything. terms of <laughs> faking human likeness, it's not there yet. That doesn't sound. Look, there would have been a, there would have had to have been a couple of different things go right. Number one, the timing, mm -hmm. being able to respond to the actual questions from the yes. 911 operator it would have had to have been pre-recorded. He would have been able had to have been able to plot um, a script 
that would be followed mm-hmm. and not have anything go wrong. Um, it just, I don't, th- I don't buy the AI voice theory. Me either. Um, especially because in, as we'll go through this timeline, you'll see that there's, it, it's, it's undeniable that she started at her apartment. She goes to the shop to buy the gun. She drives about 54 minutes to the place where she decided to end her life. Mm-hmm. She was there. There was witness. There was a witness that heard her crying. I will say there's been some speculation that she had defensive wounds on her hands. Yes, I read that. Which I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if they're defensive wounds. But if you're in domestic violence, I don't know how fresh they were. I was going to say that, yeah. They could have been old defensive wounds for all I know. I do know that there was... An autopsy performed. There's been some talk that her husband wanted to rush the cremation of her body. But generally, um, having some experience with these uh, cases, they will not rush to cremate anybody that was the victim of um, taking their own life. Mm -hmm. Just to be sure, just to be doubly sure that we have evidence or some kind of basis. And so although she was cremated, Ultimately, there was an autopsy done, and it was ruled um, that she took her own life. I can't say certain words on YouTube, but it frustrates me to no end. Like we're talking, obviously we're, we're having this adult discussion, but no, we got to censor ourselves. Um, all right. So where was I at with this? Going back to this time, so that's the nine one one call. Uh, Michael, she asked if she if her phone could be located. She was trying to activate some location tracking on her voice. Um, they utilized rapid SOS to locate her um, at 303. Robeson County Sheriff Office, Office deputies were dispatched to the Lumber River State Park at 2819 Princess Ann Road in Orem, North Carolina, in reference to a well-being check, an attempt to locate her. There's an, an image, all right, page three of the screen, talks about the rapid SOS software that they used to locate her coordinates. They found her here. I believe that this red mark that you're looking here on page three is her actual location. You could see that there's like a little creek right here. I think that right here is the entrance. So you drive in, there's a little parking area, there's a little trail that you take down here. Um, there's an observation deck there. I think that her coordinates were this red arrow, which appears to be right up against a little creek, which is where her body was found. Um, a lot has been made about the fact that her body was found 40 meters from the shell casings, which If you, I don't know if you've ever seen a clip or a video or uh, an example of somebody that gets shot in the head, but they fall like instantly. Mm -hmm. And if she was standing on an incline, she could have rolled basically into the water from where she was standing. And I don't know if that's what happened, but the fact that she's 40 meters from the shell casing by itself is not evidence of uh, something nefarious happening other than what she told the 911 operator she's doing. So on slide four, Robeson County Sheriff's Office response. At 3.05, they make contact with the state park. At 3.20, deputies request a phone ping. At 3.31, deputies arrive at Lumber River State Park and begin search. At 3.33, uh, Robeson County Sheriff's Office Aviation Division Air 3 SUAV drone dispatched to Lumber River State Park. At 3.42, there was a telecommunicator contacted Verizon to request updated ping at 350 they're continuing um at 342 detectives located a black honda civic in the parking lot of the lumber river state park with south carolina registration i believe that that was her car they confirmed the vehicle uh, to be registered to micah miller detectives looked inside and observed a black sig sour gun case in the passenger seat that's like a handgun dominic will flash a picture on the uh, edited version um, on the screen um there was a box of ammunition in the center console of the vehicle. Uh, and again, she's on surveillance purchasing these things. So it wasn't, yes. it was not planted. This, this was what she had literally just bought at three forty five. They deploy, they deployed drones to conduct an aerial search of the area while conducting the aerial search on page six, uh, detectives were approached by an individual who stated that he had found a bag while fishing with an ID inside belonging to Mike Miller. They took possession of the bag. He also stated that he heard crying, while he was fishing, then a gunshot. The individual stated he went further into the slough where he located the bag about two feet from the water edge. 
Um, on page 7 at 423, an individual contacted Robeson County Communications and advised he had located a body in the water. Uh, the individual had been fishing in his kayak when he located the body in the river. Searching deputies and state park rangers went to the individuals that one of our commenters, I forget who it was, had mentioned that this was in the jurisdiction of the state park rangers, which is correct. I think it was Mary. Uh, went to the individual's location and confirmed the information given. At 5.30, um, they... The chief of detectives arrived to the location at 554. Uh, there was a technician, CSI technician arriving. There was a medical examiner, and they all started getting there. Um, on page 9 of the PDF at 711, there's photographs in their release, and you could see uh, the handgun. And it looks like it had been shot off. looks like there's one bullet probably because it's in a position. I don't know if they found it like that or if they put it in that. I, I have to imagine they found it. Um, there's several pictures of the weapon going into page 10. There's a receipt of the purchase. It cost her I, I mean, $571. So 524 the weapon itself was 500 bucks, 25 bucks for the ammunition. Uh, the pawn shop was located in Myrtle Beach um, at 1852 Mr. Joe White Avenue. Do you know who Joe White is? I don't know either. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, Robeson County detectives investigated Micah Miller's movements on the day of, and this is what they found. So on page 12, this is what they've put together in surveillance. Mm -hmm. There was an image at 10, 13 a.m. at 2323 Margarita Drive, Unit 513 in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, um, 29577. This was Saturday, April 27th of 2024. There's a picture of her. She's holding what appears to be um, a bottle of some beverage. She's got a backpack on with a hat sunglasses and she looks to be leaving um they got another image of her approximately 47 minutes later coming back um wearing the same stuff she's got a bag of stuff in her hand again some kind of a beverage um about 38 minutes later she has changed her clothes she's now wearing a hoodie she's no longer wearing a hat she's looking at her phone about to leave now she drives at that point um to highway 17 um, goes about it's a 10 minute drive 4.8 miles she goes from her house I'm assuming to uh, the uh, pawn shop at 1852 Mr. Joe White in Myrtle Beach 10 minute drive from her place they have a picture of her cell phone history on page number 16 where she did a search for Dick's Pawn Superstore um, it, it's a screenshot of her cell phone the surveillance inside the parking lot of that shop, there's her vehicle um, circled in yellow. And it appears, I believe, that this other yellow circle is her walking into the store. But that's her vehicle. That was at 12, 12 p.m. And going into slide 18, there's a screenshot of her coming through the doors. Now, if you go to Grizzly True Crime, they actually have the video that she requested off of a FOIA uh, that they she got hours of, of the surveillance so if you wanted to watch the actual video this is it but the the officers they the, the sheriff's department released these screenshots this is her going into the shop uh the on page 19 there's images of her at the checkout counter clearly with the gun right there in a case on the far right picture at 12 13 p.m purchasing this weapon there's a guy she's smiling in this picture um in the middle picture she has like this uh grimace on her face you know which, if you didn't know anything about what happened, I don't think that would be really anything of note. Um, she's scrolling through her phone on the left-hand picture. Um, there is an image at 1234 of her leaving that parking lot, 1852 Mr. Joe White Avenue. On page 21, she begins this drive via US 501 North, 38 miles to the edge of the lake. Uh, she drove for 54 minutes. Uh, to the park where her body was found. Um, they have images of her driving that way uh, via flock safety license plate detection. They confirmed that they have her license plate. It's sort of blurred out, but not really. You could tell what the license plate is. I don't see what the point of that was. They could have just blacked it out. Um, but yeah, that's definitely her car going down the route that was located on her phone. They have her pulling in at 127 to a grocery shop, 41 Grocery and Grill, 4135 SC41 Mullins, South Carolina. Um, and from there, she drives another 41 minutes 
to Lumber River State Park. And that is on slide 24. Going to 25, uh, there's a screenshot of her cell phone search history again. Uh, she was searching for a national park near me. She did that search a couple of times. Uh, there's a couple of other Google searches in there. It's unclear of what she was searching, but definitely for Lumber River State Park. Well, not she didn't search for that, but that's what came up in her search. Um, on the next slide, on 26, there's pictures of her vehicle parked at that park at 2819 Princess Anne Road in Orem, North Carolina, with her same license plate that they had documented before. Um, into the next slide, on slide 27, there's a picture of the case for the gun, complete with instructions and magazine, um, maybe some extra ammunition. Uh, there's a plastic baggie of stuff in there. I can't really tell what that is, but that's in the passenger seat of her vehicle. In the center console, there's like a beverage. It looks like a caffeine, maybe like a one of those iced mochaccino type uh, drinks in a can. Um, on slide 28, this is what they have. The investigation reveals on Friday of April 26 that John Paul Miller traveled to Charleston, South Carolina for a sporting event, information which is substantiated by eyewitnesses. License plate readers identify John Paul Miller's truck traveling towards Charleston, South Carolina. Eyewitness statements obtained by detectives confirm John Paul Miller stayed overnight in the Charleston, South Carolina area. There is a license plate reader that identified J.P. Miller returning to Myrtle Beach. Um, his truck was last captured by a license plate reader on Highway 17 bypass in Horry County in South Carolina on Saturday, April 27th. While traveling to and from Charleston, J.P. Miller was accompanied by other individuals, and they have his images of his truck uh, going to that location on April 26th. They have more images on slide 30, about five different pictures of him driving to a location uh, that was not where his wife was, um, and that was it. That's the, the, the extent of the evidence that was released. So what is going on in the chat? What am I missing? Oh, there. The chat is kind of taking on a mind of its own. <laughs> um, so what to make of all of that? It appears based on all of that, I can understand why they rule it a self-inflicted um, unaliving of herself. Yes. Um, you, have sur you have her on surveillance leaving the place, leaving her apartment, going to the store, going to another grocery store, going to the park, making the 911 phone call. I don't believe that was AI. I believe the account that this isn't the first time that she's had these thoughts. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine what kind of um, psychological abuse that she must have been going through. Could you even imagine one of the could you could you even imagine your husband doing something as taking an intimate photo of you and just placing it on a Facebook? for friends and family to view it's, it's, it's just so be <laughs> it's so beyond like a breach of trust it's the fact it's, that that would even be a thought in somebody's mind as like a viable thing to do is disgusting and not only like her friends and family like she was the wife of the pastor of a church that the probably the entire congreg congregation I can't say that word, was looking up at them, their family, what was happening or not. That must have been very, but very, I don't know. It's, I, I think it makes it worse than just a regular person. Being well, yeah, like it's that. the person that you are living with. This is supposed to be your partner in mm -hmm. life. That you share your most, it, like we've often discussed, when you're married to somebody, you see them at their absolute best and then at their absolute worst. And the most, and like, gosh, if your partner's going through, like, health problems, like they're entrusting you with everything. Mm -hmm. You're raising children. I don't know if these, I don't think these, they had I children think together. They had um, but they're living together. They're, they're publicly putting themselves out there to be, you know, man and wife and, uh, the fact that he would even think that that was a thing to do as a pastor as a of a pastor. church. So one of the questions that I asked you yesterday was, yes. um, why do you think that so many of these crimes that we've investigated now, there's been a lot of stuff with the church of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. 
and I have said that, look, just because you got these people doesn't mean that that's, you know, mm-hmm. upholding the mainstream mm-hmm. beliefs of, of the Mormon church. Here you have a Baptist pastor in charge of spiritually advising. I don't know how many people, how big his congregation is. I got to believe it's, let's just consider that it's in the mm-hmm. thousands. You have this person that's sitting in a place of power. People come every morning to listen to him speak, not just on Sundays, probably on Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. They probably have like Monday morning prayer meeting, Tuesday afternoon leadership meeting, Wednesday midweek meeting, Thursday they have a men's conference, Friday is the women's conference, Saturday potluck, Sunday uh, obviously the the regular church service, and they have this whole schedule and they're they're daily contact with this guy who they have placed in a position of Mm -hmm. authority to uh, lead the flock to God. Essentially, that's what they're doing, correct? Yes. And he, in the background, is treating his wife. And what is her defense? Think about that. Okay, a long time ago, a lifetime ago, about 25 years ago, when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old, before I decided, to help this, I'm not mm-hmm. doing this, um, I was in a youth ministry group. Mm-hmm. And very quickly, when I got in there, I was like, oh, you have a wonderful speaking voice. You seem very comfortable talking to people in public. And uh, you seem to have this charismatic thing about you where you get people to come to church. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to groom you for leadership. And so from the very moment that I stepped into leadership, I'm going to these leadership meetings and I'm Mm -hmm. seeing the ins and outs of it. And let me just tell you, people in church leadership are freaking weird. Yes. (laughs) As a 43-year-old man, if I were to go back into those meetings, I would have told those people to pound sand within five seconds. But my 17-year-old self... Of course. It's like, oh, they're saying that I'm a leader and they're saying that I could do all these things and I have all these potential and um, they're going to place me in leadership of these other people of my peers. And now I'm being placed on a pedestal. And they would literally give me this these speaking engagements where I would speak in front of a congregation on the Sunday ministry, probably of a 1,500 people. And I'm sitting there in my suit. I'm all 17 years old. I'm a prom suit. And I'm given this uh, 10 minute introduction to introduce the main pastor. It was like the opening act. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm like speaking at the Rose Bowl in front of like 20,000 people um, at the North End end Zone uh, where UCLA plays football, the Rose Bowl. Yes. And um, I'm giving this huge thing. And I was like, oh, this up and comer, very Mm -hmm. sharp young man uh, going to uh, who has been chosen by God that would use kind of language like that. Mm -hmm. And the way that they would get their 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 people to join their church, they literally would put you through like this seven part study. First study, discipleship. We're going to learn what is the purpose of being a Christian. Mm-hmm. And they would say that, hey, Matthew verses, uh, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus gives this charge to his disciples that you shall go forth and make disciples of the, all the nations uh, using the words that I have told you, commanding you even to the end of the age, or some, I'm paraphrasing, of course, <laughs> but it was something like that. And say, oh, so the purpose is to make disciples. And then lastly, the question, is that so you say that you're a Christian. Has that been what you're doing? No. Well, then you're going to hell in so many words. This is what they would say. You better get yourself so together my because you're doing something wrong. <laughs> and then there would literally be um, among the seven studies, this one study where it, w- it was called the cross study, where they would literally take you through a medical account of everything that Jesus went through and felt on the day that he was crucified for you. They would say, okay, so Judas betrayed him and he was taken into custody and they um, would beat him up and they, you know, lashed him 43 times and, you know, with all of these weapons. Mm -hmm. And this is what his feeling. His lungs were probably punctured and, his, you know, uh, nails through the wrist and through his feet and they nailed him up to a cross. And what the the nerve signals that were probably firing through his arms Mm -hmm. as he was, uh, his body weight was leaning up against uh, the, the, the wounds and his lungs were punctured. And so the way that he died likely is by drowning in his own lung fluid. And he was on, and this is what he felt. And this is when he, and you did that. It was your sin that put him up on the cross. You killed Jesus. They would tell you stuff like that because they're man, emotionally manipulating you to go and follow their church. Now, look, not every Christian church is like that. And, yeah, obviously it was a, an offshoot. Um, it turns out that that church that I was a part of turned out being like this big cult yes. and they got shut down and the authorities <laughs> came in and they were stealing money from people. Um, but this is the way that they got people and, mm-hmm. and the church leadership, they were some of the most effed up people that you would ever meet. All of them were supremely jealous 
of anybody that mm-hmm. was going to ascend. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was just such a bizarre setting. Imagine yourself. Imagine that you have a narcissistic personality and you're now being placed in a leadership position in a church where thousands of people every day say, oh, we're going to come and hear the pastor speak, and they're hanging on your every word, and you're Mm -hmm. responsible, and they tell people that you have this spiritual gift and this special relationship with God, and his voice is speaking through you, and through this man, you are going to receive the voice of God. They're telling their members that, obviously, probably not verbatim, but that's the general tenor, right? This is the person that's been preordained, chosen for leadership. And so if you were to find fault with him, then the narrative becomes, and yet God chose him, didn't he? They didn't choose you. <laughs> they chose him. So why don't you just fall in line? That was my experience. Yes. When they got me to, when they started telling me to do and say certain things, I'll, I'll never forget. I had to go through such mental gymnastics to justify why I was bringing new people into the church. Mm-hmm. Like we were doing these studies and the people asked me these salient questions. And they're like, so are you saying that anybody that is not a part of this church is going to hell? And I would have to be like, well, (laughs) that's not what they're saying, Mm -hmm. I guess. And back in my 18, 19 year old braid, you have to look at it like everybody is innocent until proven guilty. And so this is the standard. And you could possibly be meeting this standard. Mm -hmm. But if you yourself know that you're not, then, you know, I didn't feel great about Mm -hmm. it, but I was still learning myself. But then when they started asking me to start um, collecting money from my yes. people and uh, give extra. And they had like this, uh, it was just a mess. I said, no, I'm not doing that. And so ultimately they kicked me out of the church. But the way that it mm-hmm. happened, the way that, which is why I sympathize with this lady so much, the way that it happened is imagine. So I'm the 17, 18 year old young man being groomed for leadership. Mm-hmm. I'm speaking in front of all these thousands of people. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know what? You're being a little bit too rebellious for mm-hmm. our tastes. And so it's, this is what's going to happen. You're either uh, going to fall in line and do what you're told, or you're going to get kicked out of the church. And then I was like, well, I guess that's a pretty that's- easy decision. <laughs> I guess I'm just gone. But I didn't understand the gravity of what that meant. Like at that point, all of my friends were in that church. My mm-hmm. entire family, not my biological family, was in that church. All of these life experiences my identity was wrapped up in that church. So when I left, everybody was commanded, okay, nobody's no, nobody talked to Omar now. It was like I was out of the club. Yeah. Because Omar's dangerous. Obviously, he's being possessed <laughs> by Satan. He's going to lead you astray. Um, and so when I was gone, it was gone. Mm-hmm. The immense loneliness that I felt that this woman, being the pastor's wife, must Imagine. have felt if she was going to raise any of these allegations to light, Imagine how she would have been attacked by the congregation who blindly follows Mm -hmm. the church because they believe that they're following the word of God and stepping out of line to speak against this pastor would result in them necessarily speaking out against God and necessarily their salvation. And so therefore, it's me or this lady. She must be the one that's living in sin. Mm -hmm. Clearly something's going on with her. That's the scrutiny that she's facing every single day of her life that she's going through this abuse with things like you're going to be subservient to me you the wife the bible commands it you shall be obedient to your husband and if you're not then well maybe you're not being obedient enough and um you know the weird sexual uh demands that he would place of her taking intimate photos of her placing her on facebook uh the belief that he could control her movements to the point where he's slashing her tires placing gps trackers on her vehicle Multiple and following her and making a huge scene at a car dealership of no places. Um, he was a extremely, if he's not guilty of murder, he's an extremely sick, sick, sick individual. And he's of the kind of man that I talked to you about before. Mm-hmm. Here's what I believe. I believe this, that most men, all men, should engage themselves in a form of martial art. I've said this many times. I feel like it's a necessary... Men or women? Well, it, men and women, but especially men. Mm-hmm. Here's what I know. When men talk to each other, man to man, mm-hmm. there is always a low-level threat of violence mm-hmm. where there's an understanding that, look, if you say the wrong thing, we're going to be fighting. Yes. When men and women communicate, 
men have that mentality and they like to use their physical, their physicality to intimidate females to win conversations. Some men do that. Awesome. You know who don't do that? Well, refined men that are um, secure in their manhood, secure in their abilities, secure in whatever, secure in a lot of things. They've grown mm-hmm. up, they're, they've matured. They're not resulting to, um, resorting to that kind of amateur, amateur, juvenile activity, yes. behavior, whatever. When a man engages in martial arts and they understand what it feels like to be in the presence of another man that could rip your limbs off, mm-hmm. you know, limb for limb, whenever he wants to, for no reason at all, when they understand that fear, um, it does something psychologically to a man. And I believe that men are raised when they're young boys to believe that they're superheroes. Spider-Man, I'm He-Man, I'm Master of the Universe. My mom said I'm the strongest. Untouchable. You know, yeah. <laughs> if they're not in sports, you know, they start to believe these mm-hmm. things about themselves until they're in a fight. And they, like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan, so they get punched in the face. Mm-hmm. And if they've never been in that environment to know that they could, you know, there's men out there that could take them apart, then they don't have an appreciation for it, and it affects the way that they communicate with women. And especially an insecure man. Mm-hmm who is jealous because think about what men go through. They spend their entire lives learning how to get women, Mm -hmm. attract women, talk to women. And they spend their entire life coming up, being built up by friends and family or whatever, and then being torn down by the reality of, hey, I really don't know what I'm doing when talking to women. That was my experience. Dominic said that that was his experience. And you you go through all of these bouts of rejection And if you don't have a good support system, you develop all of these insecurities. Mm -hmm. And then these insecurities take hold if you don't deal with them. And they present themselves as in, if this woman is not doing this for me, then she must be cheating on me. Mm -hmm. She must not love me that much. And you become so fixated on that, infatuated with that idea, that it turns into you now communicate with women by threat of violence. Because it's the only way that you know you're going to win the argument. You could always rely on that. Well, I might not be, the, you know, the best guy for her, but, but I could sure kick her ass if I wanted to. And, uh, you know, men that rely on that, they just, you know, it, it manifests itself as domestic violence. Mm-hmm. I feel like this guy has grown uh, overconfident in his ability to persuade women by virtue of his position of power in the church. I know I'm going on a rant, but I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> and he used that to manipulate his wife and the pressure must have been immense because of how public they were yes. with their relationship. And, you know, she suffered severely, severe mental anguish as a result that led her on at least two occasions to try to end her life once unsuccessfully in the final time mm-hmm. she was successful. So it, ta- it taught me a lot when I was in high school mm-hmm. in wrestling, mm-hmm. the first time I've ever experienced the feeling of just being physically helpless mm-hmm. was around my wrestling coach, who to this day is the scariest. He could be 90 years old sitting in a wheelchair. I, I would still fear that guy <laughs> because I'll always remember the feeling of wrestling with him and I'm trying my best and there's literally nothing I could do. I could try my hardest, I, I can't move his arm. Mm-hmm. He's just blocking me. And if I would gra- be able to grab his leg to like shoot in or something, it's because he let me. And at any point he could have ended my life within 20 seconds by a, a split second with snapping my neck. And my respect for that level of fear mm-hmm. carried with me in how I communicate with everybody. Mm-hmm. People that are in martial arts, not only are they cool with women, but they're cool with everybody. It's like, hey, we don't have to resort to, you know, there's, yeah, violence. It's like, we know what could happen with it. Why don't we just be cool with each other? And they're usually really good about that. But there are some men that don't have that experience mm-hmm. and it manifests as domestic violence. And when they're confronted with somebody that is not persuaded by their physical intimidation tactics, then it's like, well, I just feel so intimidated by this lawyer because I feel like he's trying to intimidate me because he's whatever. On three occasions I've experienced <laughs> three times, you know, I literally did nothing. I was in the courthouse, literally in the courtroom. Um, It's just, it's a response. It's a, it's a defensive response that insecure men have to do that. Well, have you had any of the judges say, well, the restraining order is against you, no against the lawyer. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then the judge is like, we're not here for that. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, listen, buddy, every single time it's happened, like the judge, 
really? I, I was here. I watched the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's just, I forgot where I was going with this. Well, uh, I mean, uh, just in my notes. But we were, oh, we were going down the timeline. Okay, so mm -hmm. look, I've, I've jumped around. I went on this rant. Uh, this is what I think about J.P. Miller. He mm -hmm. is the lowest form of man. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not he murdered his wife, he is a despicable human being. Um, let's continue with the main uh, timeline that we had started with before I lose my place. Oh, here we go. So here's what's come out since um, Micah's death. So the announcement on April 28th, mm -hmm. on May 5th, there is memorial tributes that start pouring out, pouring in for Micah. Hundreds of people uh, pay tribute to her. Um, her body was found. Um, her husband, uh, they talk about him. Um, on that same day, he released. He was released from his ministerial duties um, amid mm -hmm. Micah's death and investigation. Um, he says that I, uh, well, this is what it says. The pastor of a Myrtle Beach church whose wife was found dead in Robeson County has been released. Um, I, Charles Randall, by the authority vested in me as overseer, hereby release Pastor John Paul Miller from all ministerial functions for a time of healing, counsel, and guidance. And by the way, the church is standing by this guy. Of course. They basically said, as far as we're concerned, if the, if the police have ruled it um, an unaliving of mm -hmm. her own hand, then he's been exonerated in our eyes. And so he's back over there. Um, there have been protests outside of that church seeking justice mm -hmm. for Miss Miller as of recent. I don't know what's going to happen to him. I can't imagine that he's having an easy time of it. Um, on May 6th, police reports show Micah had GPS trackers placed on her car. Um, Micah Miller made two complaints on March 11th, first coming after her vehicle's tire was found slashed near Spring Made Pier, the report said. The second complaint filed hours later came after Miller took her vehicle to East Coast Honda on Highway 17 bypass to have the tire repaired. The police reports indicate that the suspect in both incidents was a male. The suspect's identity is redacted in both reports, but it's her husband. Mm -hmm. um, on May 6th, two of Micah's siblings allege in court documents that their sister feared for her life. Let's read this article. This is from uh, WBTW News. Two of Micah Miller's siblings allege in court documents that their sister feared for her life amid divorce proceedings, according to the documents filed in Horry County Probate Court and obtained by News 13. Micah stated to me on many occasions, if I end up with a bullet to my head, it was JP. Micah's sister, Sierra Francis, said in an affidavit asking to be named the special administrator of Micah's estate. JP refers to Micah's husband, a senior pastor at the Solid Rock Church. And then it goes on to recite uh, a lot of the same timeline that we've already been discussing. Have you seen the text messages? Which ones? The ones that he has he had sent her. The threatening ones and saying that he was armed and um, yes. asking, I guess, for her to fix the situation by coming back um, to him. Yeah, let me see if I could pull up some of those text messages. I did see those. I saw that those were disturbing. Well, I mean, he's a scary guy to begin yes. with. Yes. He's, um, again, in a position of power. Mm -hmm. According to his family, he had been grooming this girl, Micah, since she was 14 years old. There's not been any allegations of sexual impropriety from the time that mm -hmm. she was a minor, but he was married to some other lady, had kids with another lady, I mm -hmm. think. I'm pretty sure he had kids. Um, and a, around the time he was with his ex-wife, he's grooming Micah, who is in this uh, youth group, I believe she was, and um, ends up marrying her. And they get married, and yet again, he has mistresses, probably plural. Yes. Um, so on May 7th is the, the infamous phone call. May 8th, uh, they were talking about, did I, did I lose my place? No, I, I think I'm good. Um, so on May 8th, uh, Micah Miller, I apologize, May 7th was not the 911 call. Mm -hmm. That was April 27th. Uh, they just um, published the 911 call on mm -hmm. May 7th. So on May 8th, there, that was the allegation of grooming years before marriage. Uh, Miller made the allegation in a February 21st complaint about a stolen vehicle after being discharged from an involuntary hospital. Miller met with the police 
in the Coastal Grand Mall parking lot to report the theft of her car. She was hospitalized between February 8th and 10th. Uh, the CP stated that she has known her husband since she was 10 years old and that he groomed her while she worked for him at Solid Rock Church until they were married six years ago. Imagine that. 14 years of grooming. Which I don't even know what grooming means in this context, but... I think I've seen it. Um, it can mean a lot of things. Well, I don't even know how to describe it, but I've seen it happen to a family member, and you can tell, like, the the person is interested in being super nice, and I don't know. It, it, you just see the intent where if there's an opportunity, they're going to go ahead and take it, and eventually, I guess that's what he did. He Predatory up, men. Yeah. You know? And um, it's it's it happens a lot with these church leaders. Mm -hmm. They're around a lot of women. I've yes. seen it firsthand when I was in leadership. Mm -hmm. You know how um, that was a one hundred percent completely a thing. Like church leaders would get jealous about mm -hmm. attention that other females were showing to other church leaders, and it just became like this uh, popularity contest. It was like it's it straight up just internal politics, mm -hmm. disgusting to witness. And this, these are my formative years, 17, 18, 19. And so I witnessed a lot of this, and this is how I just decided that, you know what, this church is bullshit. From what I saw, I remember this pastor trying to see if this girl was submissive enough to be in that role of yeah. his, uh, like the pastor or wife. Mm -hmm. And once he realized she was not, he just moved on to the next one. And you could tell like who was the next person that he was then infatuated with. Somebody's going to somebody's take gonna, the bait. Exactly. Yeah. And men like that understand that very well. There's certain people that you cannot influence, mm -hmm. but the ones that you can influence, if you get your hooks into them, then man, you get them to do just about anything. Thank mm -hmm. Charles Manson, that guy. Mm -hmm led himself a cult. Oh, yes. They were willing to murder for him, and they did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the, the Jonestown incident with uh, uh, that guy from 1977, the, the Kool-Aid incident. You know what I'm talking about, Dominic? Yeah. Um, Jonestown, what was the guy's name? Don't remember. Where we took him to, like, South Africa, and they were, like, at this, at this place, and then uh, a politician goes there to visit, and then, you know, he started thinking, you know what? The authorities are coming from us. We're all going to drink cyanide-laced cyanide Kool-Aid, and oh. he got everybody to um, the Jonestown incident. I, I guess I don't know. Eliana, I don't God know damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, you're, you know, it was, um, it might not have been at the forefront of history lessons over in Puerto Rico. No, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, um, to move on, so there was this grooming allegation also on May 8th, uh, Micah, so this was interesting. There, Micah Miller, she was a suspect in a now closed Solid Rock Church theft investigation. It was probably um, Miller. She was a suspect. Well, where, where she nearly stole, where she stole nearly twelve hundred dollars in donations meant for the Solid Rock Ministries missionary efforts in Africa um, were reported stolen. Uh, Miller, who authorities said died from a blah, blah, blah. Allegedly, she stole $1,200. Anyway, she's been cleared of that. Mm -hmm. Also, there was a man who found Micah's belongings said uh, that her unaliving of herself changed his life. Good for you. On May 9th, an attorney for John Paul Miller stated that the claims that he groomed his wife were um, unabashedly false. Complete. Whatever. You put on your best uh, Trump <laughs> impersonator. I don't know who said that. It's the first time hearing about it, but it's all fake news. Fake news. Mm -hmm. That's my Trump. I can't do Trump. <laughs> um, on May 10th, the police records show four instances of GPS trackers reported on her vehicles. On May 13th, John Paul Miller says he put the GPS trackers on Micah's vehicles um, and posted a, note, a nude photo of her. So let's dive into that a little bit because that's of and the most egregious. Let me guess. To protect her. <laughs> Oh, this is what he said. <laughs> I know. That's that what they always say. Like, yeah. Just I guess if I'm giving him a little credit, he says, well, yeah, it's kind of a dick move for me to do that. <laughs> so this is what he says. So during divorce proceedings, Micah Miller said he, she was abused emotionally, sexually, spiritually, financially, and physically in every way I can think of. Um, could you even imagine what that means? If you're talking about a, to a pastor of a church mm -hmm. 
and he's known you and groomed you if he's groomed her from the time that she was 10 years old, 14 years old, whatever the age was. Um, imagine the things that he was trying to probably get her to do mm -hmm. or go along with by way of, I am a man of God. God has chosen me to be your husband and has chosen you to be my wife. And this is what the Bible has to say about that. And then he would go on to the subservient thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you don't like it, then we're just going to have to tell the whole congregation then, aren't we? And, I, and again, I'm, I'm imagining in my mind the mm -hmm. kinds of torture that she must have gone through um, dealing with this man. That, that case have effect, um, was he involved or only her? If anybody was involved, I would imagine it would have been him. I just I'm, know the case has been closed, and so nobody's been implicated. Because yeah, what I'm thinking is, I I can see how, if it was not he was not involved, it could have been something that maybe he tried to make made her look bad, and oh for sure. But then say, look, I'm gonna go ahead and save you, and say like you were not involved or something like that. If you get back with me or um, something like that along those lines, and it's not above him to do something like that. Let me continue this. Tell me what you think about mm -hmm. this. All right. So her husband, John Paul Miller, pastor at Solid Rock Church in Market Common, admitted in text messages with News Nation's Rich McHugh to putting the GPS trackers on her vehicles. He also said he apologized for the damage he caused her vehicles, slashing her tires. Mm. Um, he says, I even hired PI to put trackers on her car to know if she was going to a gun store. I guess his claim is... He thought she was going to kill herself, and so that's why he's trying to keep track of her. But there's video of him clearly not concerned about her well-being. Mm -hmm. I, I had that queued up, and now I don't. Um, I'll find it maybe eventually. Uh, but that was his excuse. I've never once in my entire life ever hurt her in any way, ever. I feel like when a guy says that, he's definitely hurt her yes. a bunch of times every day, often. That's one, that's one of my pet peeves whenever I read responsive declarations in domestic violence uh, cases. Yeah. I've never laid a hand on her. I've never been. I abusive. would never raise my I've voice. Never, and like the declaration starts with that sentence, and I'm like, here we go. <laughs> yeah, we are. We, we could write it ourselves, you know. I just want to be upfront and tell the judge that I would never place a hand on my mm -hmm. wife. I've never yelled at her. I've never spoken a bad mm -hmm. word about her. I hate to say this, but my wife has issues with alcohol, and sometimes when she gets a little bit lubricated, she goes offhand. And all I was doing was defending myself. I grabbed her arm because she was trying to hit me. And it was for my protection and for hers, really, because she could have hurt herself. She was really wobbly and stumbling. I just completely made that up. But I've heard that story oh, tw three dozen times yeah. in the last couple of years. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, they're not, you know, we know how it goes. So he also admitted in an email uh, that he posted a topless photo of her. So he says, I'm sorry. For, this is him uh, in an email to her. Micah, I'm sorry for putting a picture of you on the internet. It was for less than one hour and immediately taken down. I was hurt that you are telling everyone horrible, intimate details of my past sin. And I just wanted to try and hurt you. Please forgive me. It was evil of me to do that. What if your husband sent you that? <laughs> well, I already know that you would not stand. <laughs> what the f out of here hey edit that out Dominic. <laughs> like get your shut man uh, it's a fa it's a family show but it's not a family show what it is i gotta edit myself a little bit it i mean to start off like that's a crime it's like it's a crime no you're gonna get in trouble <laughs> i could like, never imagine doing that to my wife it's i i have no words i mean <laughs> I, I can't imagine the level of violation she must have felt on that. It just, it's never been, not that I didn't know it was possible for people to do mm -hmm. that, just in the, in the realm of possible things that men would do to their women. Mm -hmm. Of the worst of DV offenders that I've ever encountered, never have I seen that, where people are, well, not, I... that, not that I haven't seen that. What I've seen is people specifically, to, well, I've seen worse. Mm -hmm. I can't say, I can't even say that. You're right. What have you seen? I, you I have, you have had two cases where they have done that. They have, uh, like, spread pictures, naked pictures of the other person. Yeah, send them, um, like, to their dad or somebody. I had one that it was in a family chat. Um, 
where it was the parents of the woman and children and cousins and stuff like that. And then um, there was another that it was sent to the son of the woman. If I got a picture or a video like that of my daughter from some guy, I, you know what? Bad things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. I would, that would so infuriate. That would be a mistake. It would be a mistake. You know, so here's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. We've been talking a lot about this and we're running Mm -hmm. uh, low on time. This suggestion that artificial intelligence was, um, here's what I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. We have seen how evidence has been influenced by the advent of DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, when it became a thing, it changed the landscape of criminal investigations Mm -hmm. going forward forever, forever. Similarly, as cell phones have become more accurate, Mm -hmm. um, they have served as bastions uh, for Mm truth-telling and affected necessarily the way, and we're seeing it in the Karen Reed case. Mm -hmm. The Karen Reed case, the guy literally um, is is, uh, deleting evidence and he's like having to explain himself, Mm -hmm. why would you delete evidence when you know there's an ongoing investigation? That's the one with the big cover. I don't want to get off track on Karen Reed because I got so much to say about that. Um, we've seen how cell phones have affected the collection of evidence and how they've influenced criminal trials. How do you think that artificial intelligence is going to influence evidence going forward? Because we've already seen, we literally have surveillance, pictures, GPS tracking of her going to a location, witnesses, and then the family saying, yeah, well, it was AI. What do you think? I think... I mean, so far, the way that I see it is that it may have a negative impact compared to uh, the other technologies. When the standard is reasonable doubt, Mm -hmm. it's another avenue for defense attorneys to latch on to. Like, look, I know that you're looking at a video. I know how convincing it seems Mm -hmm. to you. But I want you to pay attention to the tenor of my client's voice here and it could be some random mm-hmm. party contextually completely inappropriate not uh, in, in the same line of what he's being questioned on and in this video do you honestly believe in your heart of hearts that that would have came out of my client's mouth and That's now one way to use it that the character safe. evidence becomes mm-hmm. a little bit more relevant because we need to have a record of tenor of voice context mm-hmm. of speech patterns of speech and things like that by the way, uh, this leads me to um, Aura Security. Um, I got to tell you, I've had these cases mm-hmm. that people have literally claimed that their clients, or that their clients, that my clients have had their emails broken into, mm-hmm. had their social media accounts broken into. It's really not that difficult anymore. Mm-hmm. Like if you have stuff on there, there's literally AI software that could go into your personal social media accounts and post stuff for you. Mm. Not only could it post stuff for you, it could go into your email, it could send off emails, it could make it look like you've done things. I don't know if you've had a case like this before, but I've had a case where my client says, look, I know you got these emails, but that's Mm. not effing me. Mm -hmm. I swear to God it's not me. He literally had, I don't know how he did it, but he got my password and uh, he stole it and um, this is not true. Um, which leads me to our sponsor, Aura Security. I got to tell you, I was not a believer at first, Mm -hmm. but they have since. um, I've been with them for a little bit. You recall maybe two, three months back, my Instagram, my Facebook got hacked and subsequently deleted. I had to start fresh, which, by the way, I still haven't because Dominic um, is not posting content on my social media. (laughs) But that's not his fault. I was I, I was not giving him the directive. But I said, my intention is I was going to replenish that content. I just haven't done it. Uh, but it is a real thing. And Aura Security is amazing. Like it, um, I literally got alerts like, hey, just so you know, um, their your username and social media have been detected in this uh, database over in India, and you might okay. want to look into that or change passwords. And I did it right away because that's how my initial Instagram, mm-hmm. um, ladies and gentlemen. That's my attempt at segueing into our paid advertiser, Aura.com. Please give them a check. Um, go ahead, Dominic, roll, roll the commercial. Take a moment to consider our 
show sponsor, Aura Internet Security. If you have been following my Instagram or my Facebook, you would know that we have been attacked by hackers and the, both of those accounts have been deleted, ripped off of the face of the earth. It happens. Hacking is a real thing that occurs. And let me tell you something else. Uh, data brokers will sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. And you might not believe it, but your full name, your email address, your home address, your health records, your relatives, your children, your spouse, all of it is out there. I am a lawyer. I do my own background checks. I pay good money for my background checks, but it's starting to get to the point where you could Google anybody's name and some kind of a secondary source of information, such as a birth date or email address or something. And you will find that you can Google all of this information. It's just out there for people to exploit. That's why um, I have decided to use Aura, the sponsor of today's video on Aura shows me, they show me specifically which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. And I'll tell you what, I had them when I signed up for their services, they showed me there was three separate internet brokers that were selling my information that they automatically got rid of for me by taking the initiative to opt out of those uh, memberships. So cleaning up my information, cleaning up your information, and it only reduces the amount of spam that I get, it protects me from hackers that could use my information to help them access my social media accounts. Highlight, if you've been a follower of my Instagram or my TikTok, or well, not my TikTok, but my Facebook, you will know that, that account, those accounts no longer exist. They had nothing to do with anything. I had a 20-year-old Facebook account. It's completely gone because of hackers, spammers, whatever you want to call it. It's gone. So it protects me from that. It protects your social media accounts, your bank accounts, other sensitive information. Also, Aura does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. I get other features like uh, antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set it up. I did it, matter of fact, this morning. Um, it took me about a couple of minutes to get me all set up and protected um, and you get it all at a really easy, affordable price. Um, but beside that, you might already have some of these tools already, but just but not but not having aura is like is literally like leaving locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. People just walk right in and take all of your stuff. I value my privacy. I value yours. You can go right now to aura.com slash tilted lawyer. Um, to start your two-week free trial, no cost to you. It's going to be linked below to in the description. Go in and sign up for your free 14-day trial and experience all of the protection that comes with Aura Internet Security. It's powered by inter artificial intelligence. You're not going to regret it. Go on, go on in and check them out. All right. So let's let's get. We we need to wrap this up at some point. Yes. So, so um, the FBI is involved in this case. Uh, yeah. They have been requested um, I to saw get involved. That in a news article that came out, like maybe I think it said 20 hours ago or something. Like yeah, that. May 15th, uh, yeah. officials asked for federal assistance in the investigation of the apparent suicide of South Carolina's pastor amid allegations of abuse. Um, and they go in to talk about, they don't really say the reasons why, but we know that the FBI is involved for one reason or another. We don't know the specifics of it. Um, there has been... We talked about the witness. We talked about the father-in-law. Um, father-in-law comes out and makes a statement and basically says that she's a sick, sick woman. The father of the pastor whose life was found fatally shot at a North Carolina State Park claimed she was already a very, very sick woman as he defended his son following allegations <laughs> that he drove her to a suicide. He's 75 years old. <laughs> J.P. Miller, 44, says he had nothing to do with the death. Um he goes on to state that Michael is, it was a very, very sick young woman. All have been covered up to protect her memory. I have a video of Micah where she tells last year how she took a gun to kill herself and pulled the trigger and the bullet locked in the gun. Now, that video mm -hmm. apparently does exist. I haven't seen it. But to the extent that that's true... Um, that's not an excuse for what he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't make her mentally ill. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it further goes into me to expound upon the, the torment that this young lady was going through. 
Um, and even if she was mental ill, still no excuse for him to do what he was doing. Do you want to know what the postnuptial agreement said? Yes, please. I'm okay. curious. So the postnuptial agreement was essentially this. Uh, it just, it, there, there's a section in there that is, um, I mean, it has, it, it's a two pager. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's eight pages, but there's only uh, pages one and three that are visible. There was a portion for Solid Rock Misery, uh, Ministries that says John Paul operates and owns Solid Rock Ministries. If at the time of separation or divorce, Solid Rock Ministries is still being operated by John Paul, then Micah shall be entitled to maintain her job at Solid Rock Ministries earning whatever she was earning. It's redacted. Um, In addition to this employment, Micah shall be entitled to the Africa Missions Dare to Care Mission and the bank account at South State Bank account number redacted and can continue to use Solid Rock Ministries. I don't know what that, I mean, I know what it means, Mm -hmm. but I don't know how it relates to this case. Yeah. But it's just interesting to know that that is out there. The entire prenuptial is not out there. It's eight pages long. I got pages mm-hmm. one and the bottom portion of page three. So it you should just know that there was some kind of a prenuptial. What was the date of this? How do I expand on it? Oh, I already opened it up. The This was dated. Um, well, it doesn't say. On the portion that I'm able to see, it doesn't, it doesn't mm-hmm. have a date on there. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's something of notes. Um, but again, her family is speaking. This is what her family is, is saying. Micah's husband. Um, the attorney representing Michael Miller and her family told News 13 in an exclusive interview Tuesday that Micah did not steal money from Solid Rock Ministries and said she has a document that proves Micah had reason to think she had legal access to the church bank accounts. Um, well, I guess they kind of make sense why they would release that portion of it. But they go on to say that Ward said Micah kept a journal in which she describes the emotional abuse, threats, and control John Paul had over her before authorities said she shot and killed herself on April 27th at the Lumber River State Park in Robeson County. Um, there is no doubt in my mind, based on what I've seen, that he essentially drove her to this. Uh, just, just treating her like she was an item that he wanted to get back. Uh, she made police reports to all of this, and they just kept telling her there was nothing they could do to help her. Um, what are the processes, Ward asked. Okay, someone is looking there to say, wait a minute, this is the 15th time we've been called to this address. Something else is going on. Who's supposed to be looking at that? Why didn't they do a complete toxicology test? Why didn't they realize that she had bruises on her hands and defensive wounds and also a bruise on her other arm? What, we can't have people that pass away and things are going on to them for the case to pass away because they did. That's like saying that it never occurred. And so they're obviously very frustrated in pointing out things that perhaps um, may or may not have been addressed in the investigation. I don't know that they have or not, but, you know, you got to believe there's some truth to a lot of those things. Mm-hmm. And she has probably for years been dealing with this abuse. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, um, We've been talking about this case now for going on a couple of hours with obviously brinks in between Mm -hmm. because um, technical difficulties or whatnot. Uh, But that's what we know so far about the Micah Miller case. This really, to me, opens up a larger discussion about the effect of domestic violence and the role that men and women play in its perpetuation in the way that we uh, shield men in some cases in the way that women who don't have a voice, and I feel like Michael Miller was very unique in the fact that not only did she not have a voice, but her voice, whenever she did try to speak, uh, was superseded by her husband's because he was the guy. He was the pastor. Um, It's a very sad case. I don't know where we're going with this FBI investigation, but it's definitely one that we're going to be following. I have an intense curiosity about what's going to come out about Mr. Miller. Um, I'm going to be watching them very closely. This is not the end of our discussion on the Miller case, but it's the end of it for today's episode. Um, I don't want to overfill you guys with too much information, but that's where we're at right now. Mm-hmm. Um, for right now, if you've been following along this long, thank you so much. And of course, everybody in the live chat, thank you so much for being a part of this. I, I so enjoy the mm-hmm. fact that you guys are part of the show. Um, I'm going to go back and read all of the live comments that you guys, all the stuff that I missed. I don't know, I see some of the shenanigans that Dominic was saying. 
Um, <laughs> they really want to see your Tinder profile. You better produce. <laughs> Um, for the rest of you, if you care um, to follow, it is time uh, to do Family Law After Dark. And to that degree, uh, let us bring in some Purple Haze Pow. Oh, hey, it worked. That's the first time that ever came yeah. out smooth like that. Um, all right. Go ahead and roll the segment, Dominic. You created a whole segment for this. I haven't even seen it. Okay, so last week I had mm -hmm. to do this with Melissa, mm -hmm. and it's not her fault, but whenever I do it with Melissa, I feel like I get a little bit too loose. <laughs> I feel like you keep me in check and you keep me a little more professional in the way that I address these, um, these hypotheticals. Incidents. But let us begin. So our first situation calls to task what to do when one party is not competent. Oh, and that seems like a very easy answer. What would you do, Eliana? I haven't read the hypo yet, but when somebody's not competent, um, usually... They need a conservator or... Well, you deal with a conservator or yeah. you just simply litigate the case, which is well, litigate it, file end, it, set it for a trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have the same criminal rights as you do in a civil mm -hmm. case. They'd have to make arguments. Let's go through, before I start going through my table of contents of thoughts. Um, so my mother and stepfather should be divorced. The issue is my stepfather is a drunk and the alcohol has rotted his brain. He has a medical record stating as such through the past few years. They have been separated, not legally, but have not lived together for over a year. He is at some point going to need long-term care. My mother does not want to be responsible that for the cost. So she's trying to figure out how to get divorced. Neither of them have a ton of money, but they do own a house together. Um, what should my mom do? Like if she just served him, he'd probably throw them on the table and then forget they existed and miss the court date. Well, in that case, that's a pretty easy answer, um, which could obviously benefit her, but would not be fair. Mm -hmm. And this does not need to be fair. And oh, this does need to be fair. Well, I'm glad he thinks so. <laughs> um, he can no longer figure out how to pay bills, but thinks he's still able to, for example. I want my mom to live her life. He was miserable drunk for most of their marriage. You know, while these people like, I don't, it seems like we're getting more and more um, asking questions for like their family members or not, mm -hmm. which makes it less fun. Um, but right off the bat, I would just, I would just litigate the effing case. Mm -hmm. just file your petition, get it defaulted. If you want it to be fair, then you could arrange that in a proposed default judgment. Mm -hmm. There's such a thing as an uncontested divorce. In an uncontested divorce, you file, the other person doesn't respond, you request a default entry of judgment, and then you submit a proposed judgment that basically has signatures acknowledging that, look, I'm not fighting this, mm -hmm. this is going to be uncontested, but this is what we both agreed upon. Usually that's just accepted. And it's a very easy process. You don't even need a lawyer to do it. You do just need to make sure that you have all the faculties of the filing you know, cross your, your T's, dot your I's, make sure that everything's in order so that it doesn't get rejected. But to mm -hmm. the extent that it's signed, uh, that's the easy way to do it. If you really want to be fair, um, then write up a judgment. You might want to get a free consult from an attorney about what that even looks like. There's a house um, where they both reside. I don't know how you want to handle that in a divorce case where one person can't buy out the other. Uh, then you either sell the property or the other person buys the other, prop uh, the other person out of their share. Um, but where are they going to live? Did I miss that? Did, are, they, are they intending to still live together? It doesn't seem likely. It doesn't, it doesn't say. What would you tell these people? What would you say, Eliana? I mean, like you said, just definitely go ahead and file for a divorce and then just go from there. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Most of the time in these situations, some family member from the person that is incapacitated comes in and tries to help or tries to become the conservator of that person and just get it done. Yeah, you may um, have to deal with conservatorship mm -hmm. proceedings, which sucks. 
But to the extent that you don't, I mean, you don't unless somebody makes that allegation. Exactly. So the easiest, quickest way to do it is just to try to file it as an uncontested divorce mm-hmm. with a proposed default judgment on the with the understanding that I'm not responding because we're going to do these things. And that could give him some rights that he wouldn't normally have because if in that proposed judgment things don't happen that he thought was going to happen and that's why he didn't respond he could always go back and redo it Mm -hmm. basically set aside the default and the judgment and say we're going to litigate this because obviously elder abuse is occurring here we need to take a deeper look into it um but that's the uh, short answer to it but as always you're going to want to consult with an attorney that's actually looking at your documents and your situation to make sure there's not anything that you didn't think to ask that is not going to change our response let's move on to a different one that one uh, was easy. Okay. So, Ileana, mm-hmm. this one's for you. Okay. What are my rights in this situation? I am on disability. Well, my husband has been the breadwinner since diagnosis. I can't afford to live on my own, and I'm emotionally devastated and shocked that he is asking for a divorce. He has stated that he will go to jail rather than pay alimony and good luck proving his income. He's a business owner. Ileana, how do we prove the income of business owners that try to hide money? Most of the time is going backwards, uh, showing the expenses. Showing the expenses, yeah. profit and loss statements. Mm-hmm. He may or may not be filing taxes, but that money's going somewhere. If it's a cash-only business, there's always, there's always fingerprints. We could always find the money. And the applications for usually the good ones are the applications for car loans. Those usually show. Oh, yeah. What was your stated income when you bought that Toyota Tundra? Yes. You know, you said that you were making $20,000 a month. Well, I was lying because I was trying to get a favorable credit term. Wait a minute. So you were lying there. How do I know you're not lying right now? Piece of shit. Yes, that's a classic. That that, that is a classic. I've actually had... um, my client do that when I was a young attorney mm-hmm. and then a, my client tried pulling that and then in discovery they came out that oh by the way I got his loan application mm-hmm. he's claiming he only makes like 2500 a month but on his loan application he's making 17.5 and then the, he literally said your honor I just said that because I was trying to get a good deal and then the judge is like you're a liar mm-hmm. I'm going to go off of that <laughs> and now we're going to calculate support I've seen it happen a couple of times in and court and whenever it happens i'm like oh god yeah. <laughs> it's fun <laughs> so he has intentionally stopped paying insurance which he's not allowed to do in the nature of oh. situation um usually there's an automatic temporary restraining mm-hmm. order that were that requires that everybody maintain their insurance not move the assets don't sell anything off keep paying what you're paying until we figure all this out so he's already screwing himself um now i have no insurance for treatment so he's going to pay for that um I can't afford an attorney, so I don't know what to do. Well, petition for him to pay for your mm-hmm. attorney fees. It'd yes. be the place that I would start. So she says that I also, I spoke to an attorney today, and while I can't afford him, he was kind enough to go over my situation with me. He says we're both responsible for all debts, no matter what, no matter whose name they're in, which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, he said we would have three options with our home. He could buy me out, I could buy him out, or we could sell and split any profits, which is true. Um, he would definitely be liable to me for alimony, for sure. He says, I'm entitled to half his business, but the problem there is that he is the business. Without him, there is no business, minus a few pieces of equipment. Um, yeah, but you're still entitled to half that business. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what his role is. If it's deemed to be a community business, then you know there's still going to be some liability there. Uh, she says, I also spoke to the social worker at the hospital while I was getting my infusion today. She's going to work on insurance grants for me. Uh, so moving in the right direction. However, I try to get husband to talk and go over what I learned to see if we could come to a peaceful agreement. <laughs> and he went off on me for going to see an attorney. And I don't give a shit about what he thinks. Um, I encourage him to seek advice as well. Uh, then maybe hopefully we can come to an agreement and save ourselves. Well, if he talks to an attorney, I could tell you that he's going to be admonished for doing stupid things. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't. 
who he talks to. Well, that's true. <laughs> if he was talking to me, he's like, you're, you're an idiot for taking her off the insurance. Why would you do that? So I'm supposed to go up there in front of this judge, and it's going to come out that not only was your wife diagnosed mm -hmm. with cancer, your wife of 25 years, but you took her off of the insurance, you piece of shit. What do you think the judge is going to come down? What do you think she's going to say to you? Congratulations. That was mm -hmm. good thinking. Um, I completely support you in your plight to become, you know, this aggrieved husband. Get out of here with that. You completely screwed yourself. He may be sanctioned for violating the atros, yes. um, um, among other things. Um, he's going to be paying alimony. I will let him oh, know yes. that he's going to be paying alimony. And it's best if he enters into an agreement to undo the stupid things that he did. That is probably going to get him sanctioned. He may end up having had to pay her attorney fees just because of the things that he's mm -hmm. done, forcing her to get an attorney. So she, the, whoever this attorney is she talked to, she, you know, he should have told her that he can petition the court to have him pay for her attorney fees. Mm -hmm. That's going to help her afford some of these costs. Um, and perhaps, I mean, I don't know. It's a tough situation. I don't know how she's going to get much. She's going to have to find an attorney that's willing to take on the case in the hopes that they might yes. recover attorney fees by motion or by sanction, um, which most attorneys are not going to be willing to do. They like to get paid up front. Exactly. So she could get some kind of family to, you know, pony up for an initial mm -hmm. payment on retainer, and then that will give them time. That motion. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best. How would you advise her, Eliana? Well... Another option, but I know not every attorney does this, but it will require a little bit of work up front also, just doing a family law attorney lien on the property if they have a... But of course, that will be... The attorney would need to be willing to, of course, work yeah. up front without money, knowing that eventually they're going to... Some attorneys do. Yeah, yeah, some of them will, but that's what... And there, There's attorneys out there. There's mm -hmm. family law attorneys that are out there. There's not a lot of them that would do that mm -hmm. because it requires all this extra stuff. It's like, you know... Yeah. I'm never going to get paid on this case. Um, but uh, she's on the right track with where she's going. But it's worth it if she can spring together money to mm -hmm. at least get the process started. Exactly. Get that motion on the calendar. Because yeah. she has a compelling story. There's no judge yes. that I could think of that I'm aware of that would hear that story and not severely punish that guy. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to be paying her support. And you know what? I'm going to award her attorney fees in the amount of $25,000 on the, which I don't know if that would be that much. Probably not. Probably not. But, you know, something. Something. Yeah, just to make sure that she's covered. But the I have a specific judge in mind. I know for a fact that she would go all in on this. Guy. Oh, yeah, I'm doing whatever, <laughs> whatever I can. This guy's going to pay. So that's what I have to say to her on that mm -hmm. one. Um, all right. Let's do another one. How do you enforce a 30-year-old divorce settlement? What is that person trying to enforce? Well, let's it go through the hypothetical. What it is. Yeah, so <laughs> mom married dad in fall of 1978, purchased a home, um, and had me. Divorced in 1986. That's a 38-year-old mm -hmm. judgment. Uh, quick claim deed changed in 1987 to just dad question is so mom knew she couldn't afford the house by herself on top of it being mid renovation and having a toddler in the 80s in the divorce decree she got full custody of me with visitation with my dad every other week and two weeks in the summer he was ordered to pay 80 dollars a month in child support when's the last time he saw an 80 dollar a month child support order long time ago um, and maintain my health insurance through his employer in exchange for getting nothing and giving up the house wait a minute in exchange for getting nothing and giving up the house and her monetary contributions and sweat equity, it's cute, mm -hmm. her attorney got my dad to agree to giving her half his pension at retirement. Mm -hmm. Mom worked but delayed major career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad has been retired now for a decade. His company restructured and he was laid off, but also had enough points that he could retire early with full benefits. My mom is hesitant to go after the pension she is entitled to because she thinks it is too stressful and will be too costly, but she could very much use the money as she was caring. Okay. Um, how can she go about getting a copy of the full petition or decree? It's from the 80s, so it's probably like in microfish yeah. in a basement somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can get it. She doesn't remember the attorney, the attorney or details, but they're, they're yeah. sure to have like some kind of, there's got to be a way they could look it up. Mm -hmm. 
It, it didn't just disappear off the face of the earth. How hard is it to enforce a judgment? Well, here's the thing. How long were they married for? Married in 78, divorced in 87. Ten. That's an eight-year marriage. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's what I'm thinking. To the extent that there was not an expiration date on the alimony, it's still enforceable. Um, there's not, you know... But is it alimony or is it just a retirement account? Like, could I, could she just do a quadro? You're right. It's not alimony. All they need to do is submit the paperwork for the quadro, and she'll get. Let me just make sure it's not alimony. Yeah, I don't think it's alimony. They can't. Yeah, you're right. They could do a quadro, and maybe there's arrears due. I don't know if he's been paying her money from the pension. It seems like the pension, like he was getting those payments from, I don't know, the 80s on or, or whatnot. But yeah, if it was awarded, mm-hmm. um, it was going to be due when vested. So there's mm-hmm. not really an expiration date. There's not a statute of limitations what I'm trying to mm-hmm. get at. Most judgments are enforceable only for 20 years. Uh, but in this case, if the vesting doesn't occur until a later date, mm-hmm. it's unclear to me whether or not she was getting that pension from the date of 1987 or when he was going to retire or whatnot. It sounded to me like it was just a retirement plan that she eventually was going to get when he retired. Yeah. He retired, but now she doesn't know how to get her part. So then I think that you're right. The easiest thing to do would just, Mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to file a quadro on this 1987 uh, divorce decree. Mm -hmm. Is it still enforceable? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Because everybody had that understanding. We knew he wasn't getting uh, re- going to retire in 87, mm-hmm. but now the date is here, and now the time to, to pay is, uh, I, people, st- they tell me I can't snap, <laughs> um, that now the time to collect is here. So, yeah, file a quadro. Quadro is a qualified domestic relations order where mm-hmm. an accountant comes in and figures out what portion of the retirement accounts belong to each party. Mm-hmm. Um, it usually costs money. You guys probably split the cost. Maybe he pays the entire thing. Maybe you guys work out a settlement to not have to go through it. It doesn't have to be stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, my guess is um, I mean, it's, it's real light work for any attorney. I mean, she can mm-hmm. probably get away with, um, I don't want to say how much on, on a retainer, but uh, it, it may be something she could even do on her own, just requesting a quadro and paperwork with uh, the self-help center out there. And A lot of these uh, retirement plans, they give you a template, and you pretty much yeah. have to fill out your name yeah. and submit it. And, and her it. daughter could help her mm-hmm. with that. Um, so, yeah, it's not as hard as, as you think to enforce it. She's not enforcing a 30-year-old degree. She's, she's enforcing a provision of something that was bargained for. Mm-hmm which is still very active and still enforceable to this day. As long as it's enforceable, it doesn't matter how old it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have a, a, a quick time of it so long as it was actually what was bargained for, meaning there's no dispute as to the, the meaning of the language and all of that kind of thing. But So that's all. That's it with that one. Um, all right. Two houses in a divorce. This is going to be a fun one. So here I am. Uh, wife and I have been separated for a little over two months. Over the last three and a half years, we bought two houses, one to live in and one to use as a short-term rental. When we first split, I honored her wish for more space and left the main home and opted to live in our camper while the rental had people. So today she tells me she wants to divide the assets. I told her now that the rental is empty, I want to move in. She said that I need to take over all financial responsibility, which I can't do. She makes five times as much as me, so has always been the breadwinner. I reached out to one of the lawyers I consulted, but um, can anyone give me any idea of what I might expect with this? Uh, We've been married a little over eight years. You either can afford to refinance to keep it or you sell it. That's a real simple one, isn't it? I just said that in one of the emails <laughs> that I was sending earlier. That was my, that's what I was saying. Like, oh. you Just sell the effing thing. You don't want to use it as a rental no more. Sell it and split it. It doesn't matter. I mean, the house is as easy. I mean, mm-hmm. either buy her out or she's going to buy you out and keep it or, or whatever. They may, there may be a Wep- Nepstein and Watts issue there mm-hmm. with a right to rental income and the use of the other property. Um Basically, I don't know who's paying the mortgages. If she's living in the one house that you used to live in, which was essentially the community residence, um, and you're living out in a camper somewhere, 
you may be entitled to Epstein and Watts credits to the extent that uh, you are contributing to the payment of the mortgage on that. Mm -hmm. And she taking up 100% of the usage of that home um, is utilizing 100% of the fair rental value of that home. You might be entitled to half of that. You have to but, look at those numbers. But it seems like she's the one paying, not him. Yeah, so that usually cancels she, out. So if she's paying and living there. There's, there's, there's not mm -hmm. much there, if, if anything. It's almost not worth calculating. Um, so they just keep it simple. Um, I would have her buy you out of the other one, mm -hmm. and just sell, sell the rental. Problem solved. Moving on, because that was kind of a boring <laughs> question. Um, oh, this will be a fun one. All right, so. How do I best delay my divorce? I'm going to let you answer, and then I'm going to answer. <laughs> this is a short one. Okay. Why? My question is, why do you want to delay your divorce? This, that's always the question, isn't it? <laughs> so this is what he's saying. He, there's not a lot of information here, but he says, my wife is asking that we divorce amicably. I don't want to. Mm. <laughs> She's never worked, and I have a large amount of savings and some stocks that I would like to see mature before the divorce goes final. I would like that might be one of the most stupidest things I've ever heard. I know, say. like that's the up, it's gonna cost the opposite, yeah. but okay. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I would like to delay this for three years. Mm -hmm. Is that possible if she wants this over ASAP? I do not have a lawyer yet, and I am in California. Sir, what you have just said is one of the dumbest, most idiotic things. Mm -hmm. I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be resemble a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. I've always wanted to do that. Billy Madison. Um, Eliana, talk to this guy. I mean, it doesn't matter if he wants the divorce or not. She's going to get it. Yeah, she wants it. She's going to get it. And then the whole mature account stocks, that's just stupid. Yeah. It means more money to her. Exactly. Look, here's a problem, buddy. <laughs> it's like you're, you're going to give her more the more you wait. So, <laughs> Sir, I want you to listen to me carefully. She don't want you no more. Mm -hmm. She is done. She's probably has her designs on being a single person. Mm -hmm. She's not looking at you. You probably disgust her. She's tired of living with you. <laughs> she don't like you. She's not going to sit there and wait three years for you to three say, years. oh, <laughs> oh, and by the way, California being a no-fault state, she doesn't have to prove mm -hmm. the reasons why she wants a divorce. All she's going to say is that irreconcilable differences have arisen of our marriage such that no amount of counseling will be able to fix. I want to be divorced. I want to be restored to the, the status of a single person, and I want my last name back. That's what she's going to say. Mm -hmm. And a judge will be like, okay. And you can say, judge, I disagree. It, it's not, well, the judge will be like, well, that's nice that you disagree, mm -hmm. but you're still getting a divorce. I'm still signing this judgment. <laughs> if you choose not to respond, if she files for a divorce and you choose not to respond, then she will proceed without you. Yes. With default. There is not a defense against divorce in California. So if she wants it, she's going to get it. Mm -hmm. The question is, should she would she be would she be better off waiting three years for the divorce to be finalized or the date of separation or what have you? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you are doing her a massive favor. Mm-hmm. Because the longer that you're married, the more alimony you're going to have to pay. If it's over a 10-year marriage, that's what's considered in the state of California as a long-term marriage. To the point that a judge has no legal authority to put an expiration date on the alimony for marriages over 10 years. So you're going to wait another three years. You're adding three years to the salary. He didn't say how long they've been married for. For all I know, it could mm -hmm. be like an 18-month thing. Shorter, longer. I don't know. But if it's over 10 years, long-term marriage, 20 years, Jesus Christ. So you're going to get, she's going to get awarded alimony until she remarries or passes away, whichever mm -hmm. occurs first. Um, and there's nothing you could do about it. Um, and as far as your stocks and bonds, she's already entitled to a portion of those things. Mm -hmm. 
you want to get her paid off as quickly as possible if they're exactly. going to mature. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that what you believe that means is that you're going to, it's going to increase in value. Mm -hmm. So the longer you wait, the more money you're going to give her. <laughs> so what she is saying, if what? I was her attorney, was like, look, why don't you just wait? There's the no more reason. Money's gonna become available too. Yeah, the more money you could even work that out in a judgment. You could even bifurcate that. Just say, look, we'll just be officially divorced on paper, mm -hmm. and we'll deal with all these other issues later. Um, but it's the stupidest thing to yes. say. I just want to, for no reason other than I want my stocks and bonds to mature. That's why we're going to uh, delay the marriage. That makes no logical sense mm -hmm. to any attorney that's ever practiced family law who's ever lived in the state of California, and that's all I have. Uh, to say about that one um moving on i know you got places to be oh yeah <laughs> yes you got you got uh, time for one more no one more okay let's do one because then i got places to be and i'm getting hungry <laughs> oh well we'll certainly next time we got to get you fed i forgot I, I was supposed to have sandwiches on deck i never i never hold up that end of the bargain um okay so still trying to get divorced after three years um all right so this is a really long story, but the general idea is I can't seem to get anything done because the court seems to now think that any answer at all they give me is legal advice when we weren't always claiming as such. I was even just trying to ask them how much time do I try to serve him the papers before filing my clocks out, filing my clocks out, and I have to start the whole entire process over and over again. And they told me they couldn't give me legal advice. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a That's legal question. Legal question. Yeah. Um, this wasn't always the case. They have always answered many questions like this already. Eh, mm. Probably not. They may have. I don't know. So I wasn't able to serve him the papers because they told me I needed to have his local police department serve him. Yet I couldn't get a hold of a local police department because there was absolutely no contact information when I searched them up on the internet, he's international. Things don't always work out that way. Um, as noted above, he's international, so everything is much more difficult. I have no idea what to do because I have less than a month to serve him, and I'm running around losing my mind because this divorce is taking years and driving a wedge between my current partner and I. Yeah, and also my mental health. Oh, just stop being dramatic. Um, I just keep thinking that I need a lawyer because there's okay mm -hmm. you, you don't you, do. you, you don't necessarily need a lawyer but you clearly do because yes. it's this clerical things that are going on with you you don't have to get the police department to serve him mm -hmm. it could literally be your current partner mm -hmm. just roll up on his address and drop off the papers at his feet sign a proof of service indicating that you served him personally and be done with it it doesn't have to be the sheriff's department if you can't find him for whatever reason because he's international then get then file what's called a motion to serve him through publication mm -hmm. or posting or some alternative means. Um, I don't know what country he's in, um, but to the extent that you can't find him, generally all you got to prove to the courts is that you've done your due diligence. Mm -hmm. You have no idea where he's actually located. You've been trying to locate him at his last known address. And then you file this application. The judge grants it. Um, unless something wild goes wrong. And then you could just serve them through the newspaper. Hey, there's an ad, and we've published in the Weekly Gazette mm -hmm. uh, and wherever it is uh, for a period of 30 days that you have court coming up in 45 days, and then there's a whole thing. They'll be able to somewhat give you help on that, but it's pretty simple. But you're going to want you're, – you're probably just going to want to hire an attorney. Yeah. Probably get it done cheap. It sounds like it's going to be a default judgment anyway. He's not going to respond if he's already international. Um, he says, my ex refused to sign papers. I've given screenshots of how he answered to me when I told him to be expecting papers a few years ago. But the court obviously doesn't see the emotional aspect of things. No, we don't. No. And it's, don't it's not matter what your, your emotional aspect of it. He doesn't have to sign the papers. Just proceed by default. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to tell the court I couldn't serve him because I couldn't find any contact information from the police, but they denied me citing the Hague Convention. <laughs> mm, I was going to say that. Like, is it a part of the Hague Convention? Yeah. Explain the Hague Convention, Eliana. How can I explain it in a simple way? So I guess there are these countries that have made this agreement yeah 
that they're going to follow the same rules for process of service. And whenever a country is participating in that agreement, then you have to follow this process that is explained in the Hawk Convention or Hay Convention. Pretty much it's a long process where it goes through the, I guess it's the consulate, is it? Yeah. Um, and they have a people in that country that do the service that ensure that it is done properly and then they get that proof of service back to you and then that person is proper being properly served um and that's pretty much it if you go uh to travel.state.gov the hague convention on mm -hmm. the protection of children and cooperation and respect of inter-county adoption convention it's an international agreement to safeguard um, inter-county adoptions concluded on may 29th 1993 but originally written in 1899 mm -hmm. Uh, there's a bunch of countries that are adopted, and like uh, Ileana says, um, there are certain agreements about how to uh, service people for purposes of legal uh, paperwork. Mm -hmm. It is a thing. Um, the way that it's going with you, you're just going to want to have an attorney do it. Yes. Just let them handle it. It's a pretty. It'll take them maybe 60 days to get something round up. But once service is complete, then you can just proceed by default, mm -hmm. and then you'll be officially divorced, and you could get married to this new guy or whoever he is, um, and move on with life. Uh, she says, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I mean, that was, uh, <laughs> I guess. But if you want to get this done, that's what you're going to do. Um, do you have anything else that you want to say to our listening uh, audience? No, thank you for listening and being there today <laughs> and for being patient with us. <laughs> oh, um, Ileana has places to be, things to do. I'm she has hungry. food to eat and stuff. Um, our audience, thank you so much. Oh. You guys have been going off in these comments. Um, Dominic says it can win. It's an edited video, but I've been trying for the past five minutes. What were you trying to do for five minutes, Dominic? Change the uh, thumbnail. For what? Because it's Karen Reed. Why is it Karen? God damn it. <laughs> It'll be changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope again, but I just want to make sure I can share and people will watch. Oh, for sure. So this live stream is just for you guys. It's for the live um, we're still going to be putting out the edited, uh, polished version of the show without all the blooper reels and all of that stuff. Um, thank you so much for today's moderators. Sarcasm for fun and Mr. Garlic, man. You guys are much, <laughs> much appreciated. Um, Lulu says she's been doing those squats. Oh, is that because I told Dominic to do squats? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about it since I have a good set of... Dominic, what in the hell, dude? <laughs> Dominic says he has a good set of glutes. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic's been watching his figure. <laughs> um, disclaimer, oh. Content is for information. Yeah, exactly. I can't believe earlier Mr. Omar read, read as cookie. <laughs> yeah, somebody said ass cookie. They, they said that Eliana called somebody an ass cookie in response to her emails or something like that, <laughs> and it became a thing. Um, there's a lot of comments. Can't get to them all, but at this point, I think we, we need to wrap it up. We've been going for two and a half hours, and, and Eliana's giving me angry looks because she's hungry. <laughs> hungry. Thank you, folks. Uh, we will catch you guys next week. Uh, look out for the polished version of the show. Hopefully tomorrow at noon, um, if Dominic has all of his stuff together. If not, then definitely by Sunday at noon. Just that little disclaimer. Um, if any of you guys want to uh, submit any of your hypotheticals or situations to Family Law After Dark, be sure to send an email to TiltedLawyer uh, at, uh, what's our email? TiltedLawyer at gmail.com? Yeah. It'll flash on the screen. Um, it's also on our YouTube page um you could also dm me on instagram mm -hmm. or, or find us on tiktok uh if you want uh dominic for any of your producing needs um he's gonna flash a graphic is is uh, a way to get a hold of him and as always we thank Ileana for coming up on the show be sure to to to, to visit our show sponsored uh our show sponsor aura and we look forward to seeing you guys next week it's been a pleasure all you guys have a wonderful weekend bye-bye <laughs>